Welcome back, friends. We are hopelessly lost without Christ, both by our weakened wills and dimmed intellects as a result of original sin. The capacity to properly form our conscience is thwarted. However, out of the sheer gratuitous gift of the Son, who stoops down to our poverty, he shows us the way. He walks with us as he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Each person thus, and that's Sarah ended at the last show talking about the paths to God are as individualized as we are. So that's, I'm echoing this. And she and I do not, we do, we, we do not get together and pre-formulate our ideas. Each person thus has the decisive choice of either entering into a relationship with Christ or rejecting him. Christ as God demands a choice from each person. Christ is not another noble person killed by a mob like Socrates. Socrates did not rise from the dead. Christ under his own power rose with a glorified body, which is different than the assumption of Our Lady who was assumed by our Lord's power. This glorified body is present in a unique manner in the Holy Eucharist. Um. Yeah, I mean, Christ, that's really, it, it does come down to that. And it, it has to, it has to come down to, because what is, freedom means that you're free and that it, it demands some type of an object. Object, free to do something, right? You're not just free, free by itself. It's just an arbitrary term, and so consequently, there's going to have to come down. There, there, there will have to come a point at which one recognizes what one has been created, why one has been created free, and you know, people who are going to be living out this the psychological freedom of thinking that they can choose their own path, right? And then people who have chosen this, this bodily autonomy to pretend that they're going to be whoever they want to be or that, and, and that mankind has to recognize them based upon their own subjective opinions of themselves, rather upon what we can see and know, they're going to find themselves alone. Very alone. Psychologically interiorized to a point where they can have they will they will end in a monologue that's right? correct because how can you converse with someone that you don't know love requires knowledge god was able to love us first because he knew us and consequently we're able to love him back because we are first beloved of him and so for us who are trying desperately, despite our, our fallen natures and despite this veil under which we live, right, to unite our intellect, our, 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 our mind and our bodies, to live the truth that Christ lived when he walked on earth, we will find that there's peace there. And, and I, think that, I think that that's going to be the only thing in the end that is going to be compelling to the other is the and and it goes back to the early gospel where they knew the christians by their love that's right? correct once again we will be known because we will be so radically other that's right that's and right hopefully that will be the beacon that is hope because what they will see is not us but us living in Christ, or however Paul had that very, you know, it's no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That's correct. That's our, we, we need to become people who radiate him. You That's know, correct. light through him so that the light of Christ not doesn't stop within us, but actually radiates from us. That's right. And you, you, you're t giving indication of where our conversation will be going because we're going to want to end with the saints because that's what they do but prior to that when we when we say that christ is divine the miracle that gives testimony to his divinity is the resurrection it is the cross and the resurrection it's a package 
And so all miracles, healings, deliverances, apparitions, scripture, the saints, they bear witness to this central, inescapable, historical, bodily, and transcendental divine fact. And with July being uh, dedicated to the precious blood, I thought it would be apropos to take a look at um, a Eucharistic miracle um, from the 700s. Miracles, so we talked a little bit about apparitions of Our Lady and their definition prior episodes. Miracles, all of them are an extension of the resurrection. They do not cause the faith. So miracles don't cause, believe you me, I've. they don't cause people to have faith in God. They just don't. But they support and strengthen the faith already received. So the people, you know, if you have faith and you're, you know, have the great, what did, I just read a quote. Chesterton talked about, uh, a miracle is a, a man with two legs. And he just reflected on what a miracle that is. we are surrounded by miracles if we brought in the definition a little bit, right? We take a breath. I think you said that. Everybody the greatest thinks. miracle yeah. is breathing. So, so miracles. So they don't cause it, but they do strengthen it. Christ is always a gift to be received like a miracle, but never an object to be grasped. Eucharistic miracles in particular have the potential to remind the soul to receive. So what's the point of um, a Eucharistic miracle? Well, three of them that come to my mind. They remind the soul to receive it worthily. It's to sustain, not a cause, but a sustenance of belief in the real presence. And it's to treat the blessed sacrament with the reverence it deserves. The Lord, knowing the poverty of our human nature, gives these signs to aid our walk with him. And so a particular miracle for July is the precious blood miracle of Los Lanciano, Italy, from the 700s. Um, so, we had that. So, I'm a, from, so, Eucharistic Miracles, I'm coming from two books. This one, Joan Carol Cruz. And then this one's a fun one, uh, The Eucharistic Miracles of the World, um, a, a catalog of the Vatican International Exhibition. So that's the sources for, for this miracle uh, consideration. 700s, the monastery St. Longinus, um, it was named after St. Longinus, the Roman centurion who pierced the heart and with that act believed in the Son of God. Um, there was a priest monk, he's unnamed, versed in the sciences of the world in Roccio, right. but ignorant in that of God. Right. So that's kind of interesting. You know, he's a priest monk, so you would assume he would have had some education in uh, scripture and theology and so forth, so on. But he's described as ignorant in God, ignorant of fides. He suffered from reoccurring doubts that the bread and wine transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. So if you have reoccurring doubts, um, after reading, you join in right, join the crowd. Right. Immediately after the words of consecration, the host changed into a circle of flesh and the wine transformed into visible blood. At first bewildered, then, after regaining composure, spoke to the congregation, to his people. O oh, fortunate witnesses, to whom the blessed God, to confound my unbelief, has wished to reveal himself visible to our eyes. Come, brethren, and marvel at our God so close to us. Behold the flesh and blood of our most beloved Christ. I mean, just that enough is enough is a beautiful meditation. The congregation was that of townspeople who want to spread the news to other villagers. So typical Christian, right? You spread the good news so that they could witness the Eucharistic miracle for themselves. The flesh remained intact, but the blood and the chalice soon divided into five pellets of unequal size and irregular shapes. 
the monks decided to weigh the nuggets on a skill obtained by the archbishop. So they're concerned with um, calibration. One nugget weighed the same as all five. Two nuggets, the same as three nuggets. The smallest weighed the same as the largest. And the weight, interestingly, is 15.85 grams. Um, I don't know what the unit of measure would have been in the 700s, right? This is metric now. Right. Originally, the Basilian monks had custody of the relics, then it passed to the Benedictines and then the Franciscans. Here comes my one of my all-time faves. In 1887, Leo XIII granted a plenary indulgence in perpetuity for mm -hmm. those who visit the Church of the Miracle during the eight days preceding the annual feast day, the last Sunday of October. Um, we might want to stop there because in 1970, a scientific study was done, and that's going to go into the ratio a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, th those stories are just profound. I, I love the fact that, well, of, out of the heart of Christ, who has such love for his priests, that he is willing to, like, I love that line, he confounded my, to confound my unbelief, right? Something like that. That's right. That's right. To, to confound my unbelief, that's ex exact quote, yes. That. What a great line, to confound my unbelief. You know, I mean, because... You know, we, we want to presume ourselves so wise and in that skepticism, you think that you're asking the, the right questions. We're supposed to be skeptical, right? But it's in his unbelief that he's confounded, that he's, you know, he confuses the unbelief that he might believe again. I, I think that that is a really good line that can give us hope at this moment where there is such a confusion for people. There is a, a, a darkening of the mind and a darkening of the, of the truths of the body. But it's at that moment, in that unbelief and that unawareness of what's going on, that God can confound that unbelief and shake it. You know, sometimes it's, it's in that darkest moment. I was talking to our priest the other day, a very dear friend of ours. And he said, you know, if everything goes away, I, I told him, Father, you know, even when it's darkest, I said, everything that is, that, that is, is living or must come to a natural end, the night always comes, but the day follows. And he said something like, you know, if all the maps and all of the different things, you know, if we lose our, our sense of direction, he said, at least we'll have the stars. And I said, yes, Father, but for the stars, we need darkness. That's correct. That's and exactly. So, so sometimes it's in these in these moments, you know, grace is always there, right? We, we believe firmly that grace is always there, but it must be asked for. Always. And if it, we can see, we don't ask for assistance to see. That's correct. But in the darkness, we'll ask. That's right. That's right. Lord, I believe me in my unbelief. Correct. In my in the next episode, we'll take up the scientific study that was done in the 1970s on this miracle. To the next time, fides et ratio.